Hello, everybody. Um, I am replacing for Stephanie, who is also doing a talk on, um, well, mobile malware. She was going to discuss the antiviral side. I will actually be showing some information on the types of different malware that there are and also the types that are currently attacking or targeting the Belgian market. Who am I? I am Jeroen Beckers. I am the mobile solution lead at Enviso. I'm also the author and instructor for the SANS 575 course, which is, of course, about mobile um, application security. And I'm also the co-author of the MSTG and the MASVS, uh, which is basically the industry best practice for uh, analyzing the security of a mobile application. Finally, I'm a co-organizer of the Belgian Cybersecurity Challenge, as you can see here. If you are still a student and you don't know about the Cybersecurity Challenge, then I've done a pretty bad job. Uh, so that's a competition for all Belgian students and you can win awesome prizes. Uh, the number one prize is a trip to DEF CON Las, Las Vegas, which is basically the second most popular conference after BrewCon. So if you're a student, definitely join uh, and make sure you win. So the agenda for today, I will explain a bit about basic Android malware. The entire presentation will be on Android malware. Um, unless I go really quickly and then I have some extra slides on iOS, but normally it should all be Android malware. Um, I'll explain the basic malware. I'll explain ransomware, which is also a problem on Android. I will talk about advanced malware, which is where it becomes interesting. And then I'll give some examples on Flubot, Tbot, Vulture, three more recent malware families that are now actually um, targeting Belgium. Not all of them are, but I'll, um, I'll explain that in a few minutes. And then finally, hopefully, if we have the time, um, how to protect. Because I don't all, only want to give you bad news, I also want to explain um, what we can do to fight these, um, these malware families. So let's start off with some basic malware. Um, a lot of people, when they think about malware, they think, well, it will be an application that just tries to collect as much information as possible. And that's definitely a possibility. There are malware families that actually do this. They can request your contact information, your text messages, uh, your location, maybe your um, microphone and record your audio. But of course, not all applications that actually request these permissions are malicious. In fact, the screenshots that you see here are belonging to a, a mobile application that's been installed by over a billion different users. Can anybody guess which application this is for? Facebook. <laughs> I think everybody immediately, Facebook. Uh, exactly, Facebook. Facebook doesn't request all of the avail available permissions, but I would say it's about 90%. Uh, so all the ones that are kind of legitimate and don't raise any eyebrows, but still, well, it's collecting a whole lot of information on you. And well, we can discuss if this is malware or not, of course. Now, Android malware has been around for quite some time. So this is a news article from 2010, which was basically Android 1.6 or maybe 2. And somebody already recognized that, well, smartphone is interesting because it can send text messages. And there's such a thing as premium text messaging services. So if we just create an application that sends a premium text message subscription request to those services, well, the user will have to pay for that subscription. This is quite a nice attack because the user will only identify the issue after about, well, up to 30 days when they actually get the invoice from their telecom operator, uh, which states that they suddenly own like 500 euros or something. Um, actually, this was even before the euros. So let's say a thousand francs, something, I don't know. Um, now, Android did fix this issue. And nowadays, when an application tries to send a text message, if it's sent to a premium service, then we'll actually ask for confirmation. So even if you have malware that has full control over sending text messages, you would still get this pop-up. Internally, by the way, this list, uh, Android has an internal list of all the premium text messages of all the countries. So if you ever need that kind of information, just look in the Android source code and you have a full list of premium services for different countries. Now, a much more recent example of basic malware is the subscription scams, or sometimes called fleeceware. The idea here is that you create a legitimate application. Uh, in the example here, it's a 
keyboard with magic tiles music games. Uh, sometimes it's a QR code reader. And the idea is that you have a free trial of three to seven days. And after, those, after that trial period, you actually get uh, the premium version. Um, the difference between a trial version and a premium version of a QR scanner is very limited. Um, but the idea is that you start the trial period, and if you don't do anything, you're automatically converted into a subscription. The subscri subscription itself can be up to 80 euros, which is quite significant. And the interesting part here is that if you remove the application, even before the trial period ends, you will still be converted to a premium subscription. Why is that? Well, in order to stop the trial period, you actually have to go into Google Play, into the subscription tab, and then remove that specific subscription. Some of these applications even require you to do it 24 hours before the end of the trial period. So basically, you're scamming a lot of people. You do have a lot of complaints, um, like just Jeeps over here. Um, this application is still on the Google Play Store. You can look it up. Google, it's, it's a problem with both Google and Apple. And the reason why they're not really doing anything against this is because, well, they make a lot of money based on this. Every user that gets scammed for 80 euros will still pay 20, 25 euros to Google or to Apple because they still get their 30% cut. Um, so quite a big problem, and it exists both on Android and iOS. We also have advertisement fraud or view fraud. The concept here, well, there are two different parts to this. Either you spam the user with different advertisements and you show it in pop-up messages, you show it in toast messages, you even show it on the lock screen, which is also possible. Uh, and of course, the user is annoyed and will indeed view advertisements, so the malicious application gets uh, advertisement revenue. Or um, you don't show any advertisements to the user, you just hide them underneath the game or something, and you still collect the money. So of course, in the first case, there's an impact on the user, it's quite annoying. In the second case, um, you're more, right, the malware author is more scamming the advertisement network, which is less bad for the end user, but still makes uh, quite some money. Some of the most advanced Android malwares were actually used to perform advertisement fraud. So this might seem like a very small problem with a, a, uh, not a lot of money behind it, but uh, the chamois framework, for example, has seven layers of obfuscation for, uh, in the end, performing advertisement fraud. So there's definitely a lot of money to be made from advertisement fraud. Sometimes it's even the advertisement framework itself. So developers will include an SDK into their application to show ads. And the advertisement framework itself will show, for example, multiple ads on top of each other. So they will collect bounties for all those different ads on top of each other, um, while the user only sees one single advertisement. So that's a little bit uh, in between the two different um, scenarios. Next up, ransomware. Um, this was also briefly mentioned in Fedra's talk this morning. Ransomware is not just a problem for normal computers, for normal networks. It's also a problem on Android. Uh, I have three levels here. Level one, simple pop-ups. So I'm fairly young, I would say, uh, but I still remember that you were able to get a computer virus on your Windows machine that just popped up a message saying, we've identified child pornography on your device or maybe illegally downloaded movies. Please pay us 200 euros and we won't prosecute you any further. And the thing was themed as being from Interpol, something like that, or the federal police. And a lot of people actually were afraid and they actually transferred that money. Same thing exists on um, Android. I don't speak Russian, but my guess is kind of that that is what this is because you can see the photo below as well, which is blurred. Uh, uh, a blurred image. Um, it's, it's exactly the same as on Windows. If you know what you're doing, you can uninstall the application and it will just go away. But if you're not tech savvy, then, well, you will be quite alerted by this and you might actually pay the ransom. Level two, actual ransomware. So we use a bit of encryption. Um, I think it was earlier this year or maybe 2020, uh, 2020 when there was a cyberpunk mobile game after uh, 
CD Projekt Red finally released Cyberpunk. There were some applications um, which were well, riding the wave of that popularity. And even though you have very nice screenshots on the left, well, you don't see my mouse, so that doesn't work. Um, though you all know which side is left, I guess. Uh, this one here, uh, very nice screenshots, but as soon as you install the application, it will request permission to access your local files, which is not very strange because a lot of mobile apps ask for additional storage space to download graphics. And then you get this little text, which says, well, I've encrypted all of your files. If you look at the files, indeed, you now have the Coder Crypt extension and they are actually encrypted. Just like, like on Windows or Linux, you have the range of very crappy ransomware, which has a hard-coded key that's the same for everybody and it's easily decryptable, up until full C2 um, asymmetric encryption, all that stuff, where it's actually impossible to recover your files. Um, so, also a problem on Android. Finally, um, on Windows, if your device is infected, well, it's pretty easy to do a full reinstall, well, at least if you know what you're doing. Um, but on a smartphone, you can actually, well, the, the impact becomes a little bit more severe. Um, Android provides permissions, various permissions, and one of them is device administrator. If an application is able to get device administrator permissions, it can do a whole lot more than just encrypt files. Um, the device administrator permission is typically used for MDM software, which will then, for example, make sure you have a decent password policy, which will wipe your device remotely if you lost it, stuff like that. So there's this malware called Double Locker, and it actually does two things. It requests the administrator permission. Sorry, that's the brick on beer. Um, it requests administ uh, device administrator permissions, and it actually encrypts your files. Now, when it gets device administrator permissions, it will lock your device and it will change your password because that's also something it could do. So they will show the ransomware on the lock screen and if you don't pay up, you won't be able to access your device. If you're very tech savvy, you know how to get into recovery mode and do a factory reset, but for a lot of people, they won't even get into their device. They won't even be able to do a factory reset. So the price of the ransom will then be in contrast to the price of the, uh, the device itself, because if you don't know any better, you think, well, this device is ready for the garbage. And that's a really good incentive uh, as well to actually, well, pay the ransom here in Bitcoin. All right. Next up is advanced malware. So those were some basic examples. We have uh, premium text fraud, we have advertisement fraud, we have ransomware and uh, the fleeceware, right? Subscription scams. But there's a lot more fun things that can be done regarding uh, Android malware. So when I ask somebody, right, how do you think your banking application would be attacked or how do you think your uh, smartphone will be attacked? Typically, the answer will be uh, the malware will try to attack my device. It will root my device, uh, which means obtaining administrative uh, permissions. And it will just start modifying everything and start stealing data. There are malware samples that actually do this. They contain exploits for common vulnerabilities on Android. Um, but given the very diverse Android um, ecosystem, that's actually quite difficult. It's even more difficult to do on I, uh, more easy to do on iOS because there's just one iOS version basically, um, and so some malwares do actually do this, but this is really not the major part. Most mobile malware actually abuse existing permissions. So we well, if you have an Android, you know all of these pop-ups. Oh, iOS has them too, of course. Um, access to SMS messages, device location, uh, contacts, or location. But there are a few other permissions that are quite interesting for mobile malware to have. I've already given one example, which is the device administrator, uh, but that's actually only useful for ransomware. Another very interesting uh, permission on Android is the accessibility service. 
So accessibility allows you to create a new application that can help certain people with specific disabilities to still use their smartphone. Uh, the example here is the TalkBack application, which is a, an official application by uh, Google. And what it can do is it can read out loud everything that's on the screen. Uh, so if you're visually impaired, it can read the screen. Um, it can also touch buttons for you. So you could actually talk to it and say, press second button or uh, next, 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 press, um, something like that. And that means that if an application has access to this permission, it is basically able to fully interact with your device because it can read everything that's on the screen and it can click stuff that's on the screen. Very good for people with disabilities, but well, pretty dangerous in the hands of a mobile malware. Of course you think, well, I would never give this permission to a random application, right? We're all tech savvy users here, why would you ever do that? So let's say we are using our, uh, our device and we suddenly get this pop-up. For applications to work properly, please enable the Google service. This makes sense. Devices, Android is made by Google, a Google service should probably help me. So you click the OK button and you get this pop-up. Sorry. Um, the accessibility section of the settings pops up and in the middle you see, well, Google service is currently off. It would make sense if we enable this setting, right? Uh, it doesn't make sense that it's disabled in the first place, but what do I know? So you click the Google service and you get this long legal mumbo jumbo. Nobody ever reads this, of course. Um, and at the top you have the off button, which you click. And finally, you get an overview of the Google service and what it would be able to do if you actually give this permission. It's a Google service. Once again, we had the, the legal disclaimer, looks legit. So we click OK, and unfortunately, then the damage is done. Um, so this is quite a successful social engineering attack because all of these screens are from a mobile malware. They're not from an official Google service or Google app. And the reason why this is a pretty convincing uh, phishing attack or social engineering attack is because all of the areas in red are on the full control of the malware. So any application can actually spawn a pop-up message which will trigger some code. You can automatically open the settings window here um, and the Google service name is also under full control of the attacker. It's something you define inside your application. Uh, you have the name again. Normally, there's an explanation here about why you want accessibility services, but I actually think that this approach with the legal mumbo jumbo gives a lot of credibility to the malware, um, much more than if it would say, be post, please enable, which is something um, I'll come back to. And then finally, we have the Google service name again. Um, and all in all, this is, I think this is quite convincing. A second permission that is quite interesting for mobile malware is the uh, drawing on top, or the official name is the system alert window, which already sounds rather dangerous. Um, I can read from the, the documentation here. So this allows an app to create a window using a specific type shown on top of all other applications. Very few apps should use this permission. These windows are intended for system level interaction with the user. Now, this permission has been around since API level one, so the first version of Android, and it's actually used for legitimate use cases. So on the left, we have the Facebook chat heads, and if you've ever used this, well, Facebook chat heads will always uh, be on top of any other application you have open. It allows you easy access to those conversations, and it's, well, just very convenient from, uh, for the end user. On the right, we have Twilight. Twilight was a blue light filter, or maybe it still exists actually. Um, nowadays, Android has an internal blue light filter to put on at night to, um, to, well, to help your eyes at night to not stay awake. But originally, you had Twilight. They used this permission to overlay a red window on top of, well, everything, and it would automatically filter out the blue light. So both of these use cases are quite convenient and um, useful. Android is 
Uh, well, Android has in, um, introduced a Bubbles API in more recent Android versions, but it's not as open yet as what you could achieve with overlay windows. Um, and it will take quite some time for Android to convince developers to move to the Bubbles API. And applications like Twilight actually won't even be able to go to the Bubbles API, which is specifically developed for conversations. Um, so unfortunately, the system alert window will be available for quite some time to come. Um, what was I going to say? Draw on a blank. Um, right. So on Android, you actually have three levels of permissions. You have normal permissions, which are automatically granted to an application, which is uh, vibrating, flashlight, internet, um, Bluetooth, I think. Then you have dangerous level permissions, which actually require confirmation from the user that you actually want to give this permission. So that's contact information, text messaging, call logs, uh, stuff like that. And then you have a separate category, which is called above dangerous level um, permissions. And system alert window is one of those. What's very interesting here is that um, you can't just ask the user for permission. You actually have to send them to a specific settings window, which is what we saw for accessibility as well. But if your application is in the Google Play Store, you automatically get this permission. Um, so this is specific for system alert window. If you are approved by Google to be in the Google Play Store, you automatically get the system alert window permission if you request it. So if malware is somehow able to circumvent the Google Play uh, antivirus scanners, you will automatically get this permission. Now, these two permissions, accessibility and system alert window, very interesting, but what can we do with uh, these, well, with the combination? So quite some years ago, a few researchers figured out the cloak and dagger attack. Um, I'm using Facebook here because they also used Facebook in their example. So let's say you open the Facebook application and you see the login screen. You wouldn't think twice about it. You would just enter your email or phone number and your password, and you would click on login. Now, what the malware actually does is it uses the system overlay, the system alert window, to actually put a transparent window on top of the active application. So the malware would create the screen on the right, which simply contains uh, a copied portion of the application, which includes the username and password, and then also a login button. So when the user would actually fill in their credentials and click login, well, it would use accessibility to take those values and enter them into the original application. So after clicking login, you would automatically also log in to the Facebook application. So it's a full man in the middle on, well, the view stack of your device. And this is incredibly difficult to spot, if not impossible, because as soon as you press the home or whatever, the transparent window would also disappear and you just wouldn't know that there's another view on top of the targeted application. Right. So let's take a look at some more specific examples of malware that is actually abusing these permissions to attack well, financial applications and to attack Belgium. So in May 2021, we got this uh, message here. More than 9,000 phones hacked by fake B-Post text messages. I know I should have put the meme here for over 9,000, but you guys can just imagine it. Um, so over 9,000 phones were hacked by fake B-Post text messages. I've, had a, I've received a lot of these text messages. Um, most of them are actually filtered by my device automatically. Some of you might even not know it because in the text messaging section, there's also a, um, a spam tab, which actually does collect quite some text messages. Uh, even if you have an iPhone, of course, you still get these text messages. Some of them contain simple phishing, asking for credentials. Some of them actually contained a link to an Android mobile application. So what happens if you click one of those links, download a mobile application, and install it? So these screenshots are very similar to what I showed earlier. On the left, we have, well, the original view of the application, which actually tries to explain why they need accessibility, how you enable it, uh, all that stuff. If you click this button, 
you would go to the accessibility window unless you click it within five seconds and then it will say, no, 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 please read the screen first before you click continue, uh, which is quite annoying when you're reverse engineering the thing. So when you click next, it will show the accessibility list of all the features. And we can see here that there's a B-Post service now, which is turned off. Um, there's also an evil service, which I created myself, and a screen logging service, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Once you click the B-Post uh, service, they didn't show an explanation of why they need the service. Um, in general, they didn't put too much effort into attacking Belgium. Um, so no description provided. And then they are waiting for you to click this button here. As long as you haven't clicked the button yet, the device will be super annoying because it will show these pop-ups, the toast messages at the bottom, and they will give you notifications at the top, and the device will just continue to vibrate and vibrate and vibrate until you turn on accessibility service. Once again, something super annoying when the device is laying there and you're trying to reverse engineer the malware. Um, so eventually you click allow, um, the application will just close and it will give a small pop-up message stating that um, system service not supported for this device, something, it's just something generic where you, where you as the user would think, ah, okay, something failed, I don't know, I'll just continue with my life. So let's take a, a closer look at the application itself. So the main application that you get from the phishing URL, it's actually heavily encrypted, uh, heavily protected, heavily obfuscated. Um, the older versions used a single obfuscator, but it was Unicode obfuscation, so I don't know, that's probably not readable on the slide here. Um, Unicode obfuscation is quite annoying because, for example, they also have uh, right to left converters, so your method name starts and then halfway it goes the other way again. Uh, stuff like that, a lot of rectangular squares and stuff you just can't read. So that's quite annoying. And the more recent versions, like 4.1, uh, they stopped using Unicode, which uh, I was thankful for, but they did use a combination of at least two different types of obfuscator. Um, so quite annoying as well. They also use string encryption, which makes reverse engineering it, again, a little bit more difficult, and also a lot of Java reflection. So the combination of these two makes it so that it's even difficult to figure out which Android APIs or system APIs that the application is using. Normally, you can figure out quite some stuff based on the actual interaction with the official API, but if everything's obfuscated and reflection is used, then static analysis will be incredibly tedious. Um, so you typically go to a, a static combination with dynamic analysis and then go back and forth the entire time. The first sample I investigated also contained the entire WhatsApp code base. Um, WhatsApp is huge. It's Facebook, of course. It's huge. Um, on Android, it's actually very easy to take an application, disassemble it, add some code, reassemble it, and sign it again. The original code would still work, even though the, well, as you can see here, the Bpost application doesn't even use it. Um, so the main purpose there is just to make it more difficult for a an, an, uh, reverse engineer to figure out what is happening. Um, the plus side here is that if you can identify the exact version of WhatsApp, for example, you can disassemble both applications, you can compare them, and you can figure out which code has been added to um, the malicious sample. So after a lot of reverse engineering, um, I figured out that, well, the initial dropper only does one thing which is it loads a decrypted text file which contains the actual payload. So on Android, it's possible to load external code. You can either download it from a C2 server or you can have it encrypted in your APK file inside the application itself. And then you can decrypt it and load it to offer additional functionality. Um, the interesting part here is that the only thing that's protecting normal applications from doing this and thus downloading extra malicious code is the Google Play Store. So if you try to upload an application to the Google Play Store, they will try to detect if you are actually uh, dynamically loading code. Um, that means that any application which is loaded outside of the Google Play Store, such as through phishing, um, is free to just download extra code, to download additional modules from a C2 server, to decrypt stuff, load stuff, uh, all that interesting stuff. 
Now, an additional nice thing here about Flubot is that it did not remove the, the decrypted text file after actually loading it. So what you will see for malware is, well, let's say, take on Windows, they will load an encrypted file, they will decrypt it in memory, and then jump to that payload. On Android, this is actually possible, but the developers of this Flubot uh, didn't take that into account. And if you simply run the application and then use ADB shell to get a terminal on the device and just navigate to the application folder, you can just find a DEX file there, which contains the decrypted code. Uh, it is hidden as a JSON file, but well, a simple file um, command will show you that it's actually a DEX file. So if we actually analyze the payload, all right, so we had the dropper application, which was heavily obfuscated, and now we found the payload, we actually see that it's not that well obfuscated. Um, this is one of the earlier versions of Flubot. More recent versions have become more obfuscated. Um, but here it's quite easy to take a, an older version and compare it with a newer version to still figure out the exact logic and to quickly identify the, the, the core flows inside the, the payload to still be able to work with that heavily obfuscated version. On the left, you can already see some interesting class names, uh, which of course shows that it's not well obfuscated. Uh, we see the DGA, the domain generation algorithm. We see some SMS and MMS functionality. We see a contact list over here. Sorry, there's a browser activity and there's some encryption. So let's take a look at these different aspects. Flubot uses a DGA, domain generation algorithm, which is something that has existed for many years. Uh, if you've done Windows or Linux reversing and malware analysis, uh, you will know about this. However, on Android, it doesn't happen that often. Um, so we are, well, we, I'm not part of malware developers, but we are uh, lagging a bit behind to the, the normal malware scene. Um, Flubot generates over five, no, not over, exactly 5,000 random domain names, and it then shuffles them. So it's not a sequential list that it will go through. It will just generate 5,000 and shuffle them. There are different seed values per country where the malware is active. And the combination of this makes it really difficult to perform a sinkhole attack. You could register one of those 5,000 generated domains and then um, try to sinkhole the malware. But because it's randomized, you would actually have to sinkhole all those 5,000 domains. And you would have to repeat this every month. Um, there's also an additional hurdle, which will come up in the next slide. Um, and finally, originally it was using normal DNS queries to figure out if a domain was active, but more recent versions have gone to DNS over HTTPS, which is using uh, Google, Cloudflare, and Alibaba, which makes it even more difficult to sync this on a network level, right? Because you don't have any insight into uh, DNS over HTTPS. Now, an additional reason why it becomes quite difficult to sync all this kind of malware is because all of the data that is sent from the mobile application to the backend is encrypted with the, the public key of the C2 server. This means that even if we sync all a domain, we will have incoming connections, but we won't be able to read the content. We won't be able to know what exactly is being sent to the C2, which also means that we can't reply in a meaningful way. Because, well, there's an identifier on the left. Uh, we need to reply in a, in a correct fashion. So um, even if we are able to sync all something, we um, wouldn't be able to reply. And the malware can just continue searching for a valid C2 that can actually provide a meaningful response. The actual response itself, it's XOR-based encryption with a hard-coded key. So it's not difficult to figure this out once you have a man in the middle. Uh, but it is difficult to sinkhole and pretend to be a C2 server here. Uh, acquiring the man in the middle position itself, if you're used to Android, it was really easy. Uh, it's much more easy than getting a man in the middle on a financial application, which uses SSL pinning and anti-root detection, all that stuff. Um, but on, for this malware, it's quite easy to get that man in the middle position. Now, at this point, well, we would have to go back to static analysis, figure out exactly how things are encrypted, uh, extract the public key, encrypt stuff ourselves, and maybe interact with the backend. 
However, that's quite a lot of work, and well, I am rather lazy. So my approach was to use Frida. Frida, if you don't know it yet, uh, is a dynamic instrumentation toolkit. It injects an entire JavaScript runtime into a running process, and then you can uh, create JavaScript files to actually interact with the application. Um, Frida is really powerful because you can interact both very low level, you can dump memory and modify register values and stuff like that, and you can also interact very highly. You can modify Java classes, Java implementations, you can call code yourself, etc. Frida was originally made for mobile, but it also works on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, a few other um, environments. So if you do this kind of work and you don't know about Frida, definitely look it up. So on the left, we have um, a script. Uh, most of it is boilerplate. The most important part is on line five, it should be large enough, um, which gets a reference to a specific clause. Now, the goal of this script is to hook whichever clause is called right before the data is encrypted, because then we can print the, the, the unencrypted value and we can modify it. So finding this string here, this specific clause, can actually take you hours or days, depending on the obfuscation. But once you have it, it's pretty straightforward. So we get a J clause, which has a C method, uh, obfuscated as well. But the arguments are a settings object, the command, which is actually the payload being sent to the server, and a host. Because of course, the DGA decides the host, and um, it needs this as an argument as well. We simply do some logging statements, we call the original method because we still want to have the malware send the actual payload so that we get the return value. And then we print the return value as well. So if we run the application using Frida, uh, which you can see at the top, it will start printing all of the different calls to this obfuscation function. We can see a pre-ping command. Um, all of them are to a Russian server, which was active at that time. So we have a pre-ping, which just says, hey, I'm an active device, I've been infected. We have the um, SMS rate, which is a configuration, and this basically means that it will ask for a new text message to send every 10 seconds. We have a general ping, so after the pre-ping, we have a normal ping with some device information, and the final digit here is one, which means that Google Play Protect is enabled. So the server responds with, please disable Google Play Protect. And at this point, it will use accessibility service to open Google Play, click on the settings, click on Google Play Protect, and disable it. So fully automated happens within one second. Next up, it asks for get inject list. And after the command, it gives a list of all of the different applications that are installed on the device. So the response of the server will be a list of the applications that it wants to attack. In this example here, we have only one application that will be attacked, which is com.binance.dev, which is a Bitcoin or um, blockchain app. I don't know. I don't use it. Um, next up, it will request an inject, so get inject for the Binance application, and the response is an HTML page. Finally, we have the get SMS, which receives a number and a message. So first, let's zoom in on the SMS messages. The, the malware will request for the backend, do you have some SMS messages for me to send so that I can further propagate through the network? Um, and it will give different numbers, and these numbers actually come from the contacts list of other compromised devices. So that's a good way to actually collect a whole bunch of legitimate phone numbers, and you don't have to sequentially go through the entire cell phone range. Additionally, uh, because the infected devices are actually sending around the phishing, phishing messages, these meshes, messages will actually come from legitimate phone numbers. It's not a phishing campaign that's being sent through 8800 or one of those premium numbers. You actually get it from a random other infected person. Um, I've known people who were infected and they actually were called by people who they sent a text message to, and they were complaining, well, stop sending me these spam messages, stop phishing me, stop spreading malware. Uh, and they, of course, had no idea what was going on. Um, telecom providers are actively trying to stop this. Um, my sister, who has an iPhone, got one of these messages. 
she forwarded the SMS message to me. So she didn't take a screenshot, she actually forwarded the message. And she immediately got a message from Proximus saying, your um, SMS message privileges have been uh, discontinued for seven days. So she wasn't able to send text messages for seven days. Even though she has an iPhone, she's not infected. But she, well, she sent one phishing SMS to me. Uh, I, I thought it was really funny. She, she didn't really. Um, all right, so the, the, this is how the, the, the malware propagates, right? It takes a bunch of contact information. It sends it to a different device. So it's not that I will get a message from somebody I know, but it, well, I will get a message from somebody random in Belgium. All right, next up, we have that get inject command. Um, the get inject command is followed by a list of applications that are installed on the device. So of course, I want to know exactly which applications are being attacked. Um, but it's only the server who will respond with a list of applications if I give it a nice list of applications that's installed on my device. So I once again used Frida. Uh, I hope it's big enough. Um, it's the same method. It's just in a different sample so that the name is different. It's a panel rec class over here. And once again, we have the host name and the payload. And using Frida, I just, well, the first thing I did was create a list of all potential financial applications. This was quite difficult, actually. So I just went to older write-ups of banking malware. And for all of them, I just copy-paste all of the lists of the targeted applications, threw them in one big list, and then also added all of the Belgian financial applications. Because so far, Belgian actually hasn't really been attacked by mobile banking malware. So I created a very long list with over 700 different applications. And then I simply checked, well, if we are doing the get inject list command, um, I will modify that and just append all of these applications. And then the, um, the server will reply with all of the applications that it's actually attacking, which I think in this case were about uh, 14 uh, applications or something. Finally, we have the get inject, which is the actual attack. Um, just to show the power of Frida, I took the response value, which is the HTML code, and I just saved it to a file on the device, which I could then um, pull from the device, render in a browser, and I ended up with this. So this is a combination of a whole lot of websites, a whole lot of HTML code, and all of these views are actually, at, uh, well, they're simulating a financial application. So how the malware, the malware works is it will wait for you to launch one of these applications. And when you do so, it will show a web view on top, which is non-transparent. So it just covers the entire screen. And it will show one of these login prompts. Luckily, Flubot so far not attacking Belgian applications. Uh, what's also interesting here is that all of these applications actually require the user to authenticate using a username and password, which already is something that we don't have in Belgium. We have much stronger onboarding using um, It's Me or a card reader. So no Belgian target so far, but that is quite surprising because the application was called Bpost, which is, well, our Belgian post um, company. There is Dutch localization. So they do attack the Netherlands, so that kind of makes sense. Uh, there is a specific seed value for the DGA for Belgium, which once again shows they are actively targeting Belgium. Um, and it is spreading through Belgian text messages. So it's kind of weird that they're not actually attacking Belgian banks yet. Um, next up, we have Tbot or Anatsa. Around the same time, um, so also May 2021, um, there was a new malware family, Tbot, who did actually attack Belgian applications. So this was just a small mention in a, uh, a blog post somewhere. Uh, but it, initially, uh, it immediately triggered me because I thought, well, Belgium hasn't been attacked yet, so this is awesome. And I spent a few nights reverse engineering the sample. And it turns out that Flubot and Tbot are very similar, but also very different. While Flubot is technically quite strong, and it has a DGA, so it generates random domains, uh, and it has C2 encryption, which really helps against the sinkholing as well, Tbot just had a hard-coded domain name, and it, did, it barely did any encryption. So very easy to intercept Tbot, very easy to see what's going on communication-wise. 
um, which is much different than Flubot. Even though under the hood, their structure is quite similar, um, most likely they are different teams, though I'm not into the uh, attribution, attribution game. Um, but some malwares have, the source code of some malwares have been leaked quite some years ago, and different malware variants are still uh, using that as their basis to um, develop further on. Propagation is similar, though Tbot mostly focuses on a dropper, which means they actually get a, another application to install their malicious application. Uh, but more, more recent versions are actually also using smishing, so sending text messages. Now, on the impact side, Tbot is much more interesting. So the accessibility abuse, so the permission, is rather limited on Flubot. All right. Okay. So you have information I don't have, which is very interesting. Uh, I'm just a lonely reverse engineer, so definitely possible. And there, yeah, there are definitely links. Though I still think it's surprising. Uh, everybody, uh, he said, by the way, that um, if you're following a specific phishing message, you would either get Flubot or Tbot, uh, which would indicate some kind of working together, uh, which is definitely possible. I didn't uh, analyze all the samples. So thank you for that input. Very interesting. Um, yeah, so um, accessibility abuse uh, is quite limited on Flubot. They just use it to detect the uppermost application and then um, trigger the web view. Um, and they also disable Google Play Protect. While on Tbot, you have a full key logger. So if your application is targeted, they will actually intercept every accessibility event related to your application, which will work as a full key logger. Finally, overlay attacks, Flubot, no Belgian apps, while uh, Tbot did attack Belgian apps. So, which applications were attacked and how? Well, currently, or at least the sample that I investigated, only had one overlay attack, which was on the Belfius mobile application. This says nothing about the security of the Belfius mobile application. This says absolutely nothing about the security of any of the other Belgian financial applications. I have no idea why they chose Belfius, and actually the only thing that they are requesting is the debit card number. I'm not actually sure if you can do anything meaningful with a debit card number. They don't ask for a uh, credit card number. They don't ask for a CVC. They don't ask for a pin code, anything like that. So maybe it was just the first uh, tip in the water to see if, they, um, if the Belgian market is interesting. So there's one overlay attack for Belfius, and there were key loggers for 13 different Belgian applications. Um, now, what does it mean to have a keylogger on an application? Well, there's an application you can install called ScreenLogger from the Google Play Store, which will actually register an accessibility service and will print everything that it receives. The reason why I took this application is because it actually doesn't request internet permission, which for me was very comforting because then I know it's not sending my data uh, anywhere online. And on the second image here, you can see that I, well, I was typing in some text, test.test.com, and every letter I typed would show up, so it's sequential. So you get a lot of information, you do get a lot of information, and you can even get passwords, because even though they are asterisks or small dots in the password field, the last letter that you enter is shown visibly, and that is actually communicated to the malware as well, or to the accessibility service. Now, even though you have a full keylogger, this malware still does not have access to the application storage. When you authenticate to a mobile financial application, you will require certain cryptographic secrets which are stored on the application storage. So even if, let's say, they would be able to get the pin code that you use to authenticate to Belfius, let's take an example, they still wouldn't be able to onboard a new application using that pin code. Right? Even if that pin code would be the same as the actual pin code for your debit card, it would be useless, right? Because the onboarding of these financial applications requires it's me or a card reader. Um, yeah, one of those two. So the bad. Um, yeah, the good is also a lack of context. You get a lot of information, but unless you figure out exactly how a specific application works, that's really a lot of work. Um, some of these malwares actually attack 
200 or 300 different applications. So that would require a significant amount of reverse engineering to fully piece together an, an accessibility trace. Um, and finally, there's no interaction with the applications yet. It's just monitoring, and it's not actually pressing buttons itself in any way. Finally, Vulture, third example. A very small malware was uh, discovered in July 2021. Um, the interesting part here is um, it uses a VNC server to actually do a full screen capture of the device. Um, so this is re research from Threat Fabric, and I only was able to do a little bit of reverse engineering on this sample before the C2 server um, went down. It's design-wise, it's quite nice. So once again, it's motivating you to click the services icon. We do have a little bit of explanation on why they want accessibility. And then one, once you open one of the targeted applications, in this case, the uh, Spanish Bankia application, it's quite small, but you could see on top here that it has actually started broadcasting uh, or casting your device to a, another screen. This is something you would see if you well, broadcast it to your uh, Google Chrome. No, um, what's the thing you used to watch on the TV? Chromecast. Jesus. Uh, so if you cast to a Chromecast, you would see this icon. What the malware does is it creates a local service that is costable to. And then as soon as you open the application, it will cost to that application. So it's doing a full recording of your screen interaction. And then after a few minutes, it will start sending this information to the C2 server. From a re reversing, engine, uh, reversing point of view, the Vulture malware is really boring. Um, the list of targeted applications is actually just inside a file that's part of the application. Um, here you see all, well, all of the targeted applications together with a number, which I'm fairly certain is the number of seconds that it will record before it would send. Some of, the, some of them are 60, some of them are 90 or 120. Uh, no Belgian applications in this, so that's quite good. And they still have no direct interaction with the application. Um, the bad is that they are attacking our neighbors, so there are some Dutch banks that are being targeted this way. And, and this is also the reason why I wanted to mention the Vulture malware is because it is actually a nice step towards a full interactive attack on your application. So if the T-Bot and the FluBot, who are apparently already working together, also invite the, um, the Vulture guys, it's not too difficult to actually take this one step further and wait for somebody to open their financial application uh, real time, in real time view, whatever they're doing, and then at some point turn the screen black and start clicking buttons yourself as the malware owner. So far, no issue yet, but this is a potential future development, which would be quite scary. We do have time for a little bit of good news, or at least um, try to protect ourselves. Um, I have two slides here, protecting the user or protecting the application. Once again, user awareness is super important. Most malware is installed outside of the Google Play Store. Not all of them. The Google Play Store is not infallible. It will sometimes leave uh, malware up for quite some time. Um, but telling people that they shouldn't click on text messages, that they shouldn't install applications, is definitely very important. Uh, Federa was talking about that as well this morning. Um, don't ever grant accessibility permissions, unless you really have a disability, of course, but most likely you won't ever have to do this for a legitimate application. If you have users to protect inside your corporate network using MDM, it is possible to disable installations from unknown sources, which would also mean that you can only install applications from within Google Play Store, so that's a nice additional control as well. And thirdly, also a little bit of user awareness, is to encourage biometrics. Because if we keep going the way that, well, the combination of Vulture, T-Bot, FluBot, um, it is technically possible to do a full interactive man in the middle, but accessibility will never be able to bypass biometrics. At some point, if your application is protected with biometrics, you will have to put your thumb on the screen or you will have to show your face. Um, so in that regard, I think that biometric is more secure than a pin code. 
And of course, Biometric also protects against shoulder surfing, so you should be using it uh, anyway. Protecting the application is difficult, uh, but not impossible. So the actual overlay, the web view on top of the application, it's nearly impossible to accurately detect. There's no real way to know if you're being attacked by a malware or by uh, chat heads. You can just tell, well, there is something on top of me. But of course, you don't want to block a, a bank account because somebody's using Facebook heads or chat heads. That doesn't make sense. So you have many false positives here. Um, it is possible to detect these malicious applications, even if Google and Google Play Protect is not able to detect them. Um, so you can't really rely on Google, though they will also block malware. If I install the Vulture malware, it will immediately get uh, detected and deleted. But a lot of them also are not accurately detected. So there are a few commercial offerings um, that offer on-device malware detection. So it's an SDK that you can include in your application, um, which will actually scan all other applications and will mostly check out the combination of uh, the system alert window and accessibility services because a legitimate application most likely will not need that combination. Uh, but they go much further. Of course, that's internal knowledge, and I don't know exactly how they work. But apparently, they have a very good um, false positive rate, which is the main thing that you're worried about here. Now, what do you do if you detect that a user's device is under attack? I would say it fully depends on the false positive rate. Um, I would probably never go towards an immediate block of an application, though I'm not in the risk assessment field. I'm in the reverse engineering field. Um, but it's a good indicator to include in your risk analysis. It might make sense to actually temporarily block them. It might make sense to make them onboard the application again. It might make sense to actually prevent application onboardings because with this kind of attack, there's a chance that they will create a secondary device which is fully onboarded as the victim. So a new onboarding could be blocked. And maybe you will require some step authentication, such as biometrics. Um, yeah. Well, that's basically it. Um, if you want to know more about the technical stuff, I did write quite some articles on the blog, Enviso blog. Um, it also explains the different steps I took to reverse engineer the malware, and it also includes all of my failures, which I think is something important to do because it will just show my train of thought and everything that did not work, but would still give interesting information in case it would work. Um, so yeah, if there are any final questions, don't hesitate to shout them out or come see me during the break. Don't be shy. Unless you know me and you just want to ask a difficult question, then please don't. <laughs> I know who you are. Hi, uh, thank you for the uh, interesting talk. You just mentioned that uh, biometric security could um, yeah, prevent these mm -hmm. uh, kind of malware, but can't they just cancel the biometric and enter a code? Because m mostly they have got a backup with codes for the biometrics? Or? Yeah, very good question. Um, the biometrics is actually handled by the system itself, which is a, like a screen on top of the application. I don't even think there's an API that will actually allow you to, to, to click the cancel or whatever. I even don't think accessibility can click the cancel, but it is something that I now want to try out because it is an excellent suggestion. Um, as far as I know, accessibility cannot interact with a system level thing on top. But very good question. Uh, I'm going to try it out probably tonight. Uh, and I'll let you know. And uh, if not, I have to modify my slide. So <laughs> thanks. Any other questions? Yes. I had extra slides on iOS malware. So it's not just Android who has the problem. But well, time's up. So you mentioned that uh, reversing Flubot was difficult. Uh, how long did it take you? How did what? Um, so, Flubot, yeah. how long did it take to reverse it? You said that it's, um, it was encrypted, uh, the main yeah. application was really tricky to, to look it into. It didn't take too long, uh, but mostly because I do have quite some experience with reversing Android, and the combination of Static and Frida works rather well. It took me 
10 hours or something, because it came out on Tuesday and then by Wednesday or Thursday, uh, but Thursday I had to report, uh, but I did not get a lot of sleep. Uh, the nice thing is that even with the reflection and the string encryption, if you search for the right, uh, there's all, not, no obfuscation is perfect. You will always find some clues. And with Frida, you can actually also hook on a, a system API. So I would hook on a, the HTTP connection. And then you can print a stack trace, which will show exactly how you got there. And then you, yeah, well, you investigate all those methods and you figure, sometimes I just hook 100 things and see what passes through. And if you're lucky, well, one of them hits and you can take it from there. Um, also, the, like the, the newer samples, which were obfuscated very differently, still had the same structure. So I was actually able to quickly, once I saw that piece of code, I immediately knew, ah, this is that structure with the try catch and very specific. So I, I was really happy that my initial reverse engineering allowed me to quickly identify new samples, which is not something that I was expecting, but was quite nice to, to have. Yeah. All right, that's it, I guess. All right, thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>